Well, thank you everyone for joining us today for the IMS virtual user group. Uh, we're excited to have you here today and I'm uh, particularly excited for the session. I know it's a pretty popular topic. Uh, so thank you for joining us. We have a pretty simple agenda today. Um, we're going to start our presentation shortly. And then we um, will have a little bit of time for Q&A after the session, but uh, Deepak wants you to know that if you have a question during the presentation, you can uh, stop, come off mute, or pop into chat, and we'll try to answer it as we go because we don't want anyone to get uh, left behind with a lingering question uh, that was, was relevant at the moment and may not be so towards the end. So feel free to pop in with, uh, with your questions throughout today's session. I want to thank our partner, uh, BMC, for sponsoring this user group. Um, we have a great relationship with them and are thankful that they are a partner. So if you work with anyone over at BMC or if you are with BMC, we want to just give them a shout out for um, supporting this group. I'm going to have a survey pop up after today's session. It is a very simple, quick exit survey. It has two questions on it, and it'll just let us know what you thought about today's session. So um, just if you would answer those, uh, that would be fantastic. We'd love to get your feedback. And um, before we get started, I want to um, tell you how you can see Planet Mainframe in the next couple of months. So I will be attending IDUG North America in Charlotte next week on the 24th through the 26th. We will be exhibiting at SHARE in Kansas City and um, exhibiting at GSC UK. And at both of the conferences where we're exhibiting, we'll be doing some on-site interviews for Planet Mainframe. So I'd love to talk to you and interview you about your, um, your personal experience in Mainframe and any other topic. You can reach out to me at amanda at planetmainframe.com and we can set up a formal time or just come over and say hi. And uh, if you're going to be at IDUG Charlotte next week and want to touch base or connect, I'd, I'd love to meet up with you. Um, I'll be going to sessions and um, look forward to seeing you there. So with that, we are here for an introduction to IMS Catalog and IMS Managed ACBs. I'm gonna stop my share so that Deepak can start his share. And while he's doing that, I'm gonna introduce him. So Deepak Kohli is an IMS product manager at IBM Silicon Valley Lab in San Jose. He's got a master's degree in computer science from NYU and has a wealth of experience from uh, applications, DBA, performance tubing, problem determination, and You've probably noticed that he has taught a lot of courses on IMS and DB2, and he is a frequent international presenter, and he will be presenting at SHARE in Kansas City. So, Deepak, thank you so much for joining us. We're excited for your session today. Thank you, Amanda. Um, I want to thank the nice folks at uh, Planet Mainframe for uh, having this session. I think um, the more we tell people about catalog managed ACBs, uh, the better it is because this is going to affect almost every IMS client. So thank you for setting this session up. I saw some of the participants uh, who are on this call. We've got Anders from Sweden and Heike from Germany. And so there's a lot of people from uh, different time zones. Um, thank you for joining. I know for the folks in Europe, it's a little late, uh, later in the day. Um, but I'm, I'm going to try to give you a, a comprehensive introduction to the catalog and IMS managed ACBs. Uh, that's my name, Deepak Kohli. Uh, I think uh, Amanda sort of introduced myself. There's my email ID. I'm an IMS product manager at the IMS lab. This picture that you see on the title page is actually the IBM Silicon Valley lab uh, in uh, South San Jose. Um, just thought I'd mention that. That looks very nice. It looks like something in, in Switzerland, but... Uh, but that's our lab. Um, let me, I've, I've actually got two presentations. Uh, I noticed that Amanda has, has slotted uh, a, a considerable amount of time. 
So I, I put together two presentations. Uh, the first one is going to be the why and what of IMS managed ACBs. You know, why are we doing this? And, and, and what is IMS managed ACBs? And then I've got a separate presentation on uh, an introduction to the IMS catalog. Um, so that's the order in which I'll be doing those presentations. Um, but before I, I, I start those presentations, I just want to give you some resources or get you plugged into IMS. Um, so we have a IMS, what we call the IMS Central website, and the link is right there. And, and this is our site to, you know, all things IMS and IMS education. Uh, I, I encourage you to go there. Um, you'll find free courses. Uh, the catalog is an IMS HalDB. And not everybody uses IMS HalDBs. Uh, in fact, when I presented at, at, at various other conferences, people say, you realize this is going to be our first HalDB. And we have to learn about HalDBs. And the answer is, yeah, if you haven't used HalDBs, this will be your first HalDB. But we've got a free course on HalDB, and you can find it on the central website. And you can find other free courses there, and you can take them you know, at your own uh, speed. And we also offer badges, so I encourage you to go to that website. You'll also find various videos. Uh, so, for example, we did a, I think it was a five or six part series on uh, a webinar on, on IMS catalog. And so you'll find uh, the, the videos are there, too. Uh, we have something called the IMS internship. We do that as a yearly thing where you come to the IMS lab and we give you uh, a, a week's worth of education uh, on IMSTM and IMSDB. It's totally free. We don't, we don't charge a penny. Uh, in fact, uh, one evening we even take you out for dinner um, and all you have to pay for is your travel and your, your hotel expense. So I encourage you to, to come to the internship if you can. The other thing is we have an IMS monthly gold call. Um, if you're not on that call, uh, I encourage you to uh, join that call. Uh, it, it, we do require an NDA for the gold call, but on the gold call, we tell you about features and functions we are working on, you know, things that haven't been announced sometimes. Um, so lots of useful information on the gold call. We also have a quarterly IMS community call. Uh, again, these are all run by the lab. And on the community call, we basically talk about the various enhancements and, and, and fixes that we've put out over over the quarter. So it's a good way to sort of stay up to date on IMS. And then finally, uh, I, I'm this is an area that I'm passionate about is making sure that every client has an IMS advocate. And so let me just say a few words about IMS advocacy. If you're an IMS client, make sure you have an advocate, make sure the advocate is working for you. Um, who are IMS advocates? These are people that work at the lab uh, at the IMS lab, they, they could be a developer, they could be a tester, they could be a, a, a support person, they could be a manager. Um, but these are people that work at the lab. So if you have an advocate, you basically, you know, have a contact at the lab. They're not salespeople, they don't get any commission. They're there to give you what you need to be successful with IMS. So I'll give you some examples. You might have hired a new DBA. Uh, the DBA is sort of relatively new to IMS. Uh, you might want to, you know, get them some education. The advocate can help you with that. Um, you might have requests for enhancements uh, that need to be, you know, done or implemented. Uh, the advocate can try to fight for you and, and make a case for you uh, and, and make sure that the, the enhancement gets uh, implemented, right? So, I highly encourage you to, to get a hold of, 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 of an advocate. If you don't have an advocate, you're an IMS client, it's free of cost. At the bottom of the page, there's my email ID, dpacK at us.ibm.com. Please reach out to me and, and we'll assign an advocate for you, okay? All right, so those are some resources for you to get plugged in. Uh, I'm now going to start with my first presentation which is the why and what of IMS managed ACBs. And as Amanda mentioned, um, I'm a big believer in, in, in interacting with, with my clients. 
please ask questions. Don't wait till the end, you know, interrupt us. Um, and if you're not able to go off mute, then enter the question on chat. And then Amanda will stop me and say, Deepak, wait a minute, I see this question, right? So, so, so let's do that. Let's talk about why and what of IMS Manny Day Beach. So the first thing that you may or may not know about is that IMS 15.4 came out last year. Uh, by the way, we, we just made 15.5 uh, uh, GA. Um, and, and so when 15.4 came out last year, we put out an SOD, a statement of direction. And here it is, and, I, and I've cut and paste this. Um, and, and, and this announcement or this statement of direction that we made uh, said that IBM intends to require IMS management of ACBs for IMS DB clients in June of 2025. So by the summer of 2025, uh, we will be requiring that you implement IMS managed ACBs. For clients that have IMS TM only, uh, we are working on a um, we we're working on an architecture where you can implement IMS managed ACBs without implementing the catalog. We haven't yet uh, finished that, and when that becomes available, we'll announce that, and then we'll give a date for our TM only clients. Um, now, what does this mean that IMS management of ACBs is going to be required by the summer of 2025? Well, every year we've been coming out with a new release of IMS. Uh, last year it was 15.4. This year we came out with 15.5. So whatever release of IMS we come out with next year, it will say in order for you to migrate to that release, you need to implement IMS managed ACBs. And if you attempt that migration without having IMS managed of a and IMS management of ACBs implemented, then your migration will fail, right? So that is how we out the why and what of IMS managed ACBs. I'll, I'll this is my agenda. I'll tell you how we got started um, on this journey. Can you all hear me? Because I just got a pop up that says internet connection is unstable. Somebody tell me yes, you can hear me. Yes, I can hear okay. you. It's great. It's breaking up just slightly for me. I uh, if you're getting the unstable notice, you might want to go off video, and sometimes that helps the connection. Um, Why don't you make everyone else go off video and let leave Deepak on? <laughs> well, okay. So I just stopped the video, but you can still see my screen, right? Correct. Okay. So so please stop me if 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 the audio is bad or something. Um, I've never seen that before. That was the first time I saw that. Anyway, uh, so this is my agenda. You know, We'll tell you how we got started on this journey. Then we'll jump into the why and what of IMS managed ACBs. And then once you implement IMS managed ACBs, there, there's going to be some impact. So what's the impact of implementing IMS managed ACBs? What changes when you implement IMS managed ACBs? Uh, and then the implication on DLI batch jobs. And then, and then there are a few things we're still working on in IMS Married ACBs, and, and I'll, I'll mention those so that uh, you know, we are transparent about it and so that you're aware of, of the items that we're currently working on, right? So let's talk about how this all began, how we started this journey. So the catalog was introduced in 2012. Uh, actually, IMS version 12 G8 in October of 2011, and then a few months later in 2012, I think it was sometime in April, um, we introduced the IMS catalog. The IMS catalog was optional back then, and even today, it's still optional. The catalog is implemented as a HAL DB database, um, and basically it contains your DVD, your PSB metadata that is required when you have Java programs that are accessing IMS databases. Now that word metadata is a fancy word, but metadata basically is a fancy word that means data about data. So what we have in the catalog is data about your databases. We have you know, the DVD information in the catalog, your 
PSG. It's their it's their job it's it's their it's their it's the, it's their job to determine what dates and data. That's why they have such a process. They 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 offload all of the the referential data that's for all those tables for a particular period of time. I'm sorry. What was that comment? I didn't I didn't catch that. Was that directed at me, or were you having a side conversation with somebody? Okay. Um, uh, so, so that's what the catalog has. It has the the DBD information, the PSB information, and optionally, you can also import Cobalt Copybook information in the catalog. So that's primarily what the catalog was introduced for. It was introduced so that Java programs can access IMS databases. So when a Java program says, you know, go get me this segment from this database, right? We go out to the database, we grab that segment, but then we have to take all that data in that segment, all those fields, and we have to then convert them into a data type that Java recognizes. And in order for us to do that, we need to know, you know, for each, data item, you know, how long it is, what the data type is, and so on. And that's why we need that metadata uh, in the catalog for Java programs. So that's what the catalog, that's what it was introduced for initially. Then uh, we introduced some additional features uh, in version 13. We introduced something called database versioning, and, and that requires that you have a catalog in order to implement database versioning. And then we introduced IMS Managed ACBs and DDL in version 14 of IMS, right? Um, this is sort of a, a hierarchical structure of what the catalog looks like. Um, and, and I will get into this in more detail when I cover the presentation on, on the introduction on the catalog. But, but this is basically showing you these are the segments uh, uh, in the catalog uh, database. And if you look closely, you'll see that these segment names correspond to the macros that you code in the DBD or the PSB, right? Um, by the way, the reason the segments are color coded is because we are using four data set groups for the catalog. So the white segments go into data set group A, the gray segments go into data set group B, the green ones in C, and the blue ones in D. And, and the whole reason for, for putting segments in different data sets is, is typically, usually it's done for performance reasons. You know, some active segments that you, you may use a lot, we'll put them in one data set. Others that you don't use as much, we'll put them in another data set. So this was the reasoning behind um, having multiple data set groups for the catalog. Um, I can honestly say that while this design was initially done, what I found is that we didn't do an even distribution of the se segments. Uh, there are some uh, data sets, for example, data set C, data set group C or B uh, that are more populated than, than the other data sets. Um, IMS managed ACBs, as I said, was introduced in, in version 14 and version 14 G8 in October, 2015. And IMS Managed ACBs is the infrastructure for using IMS DDL. And, and when you implement IMS Managed ACBs, you must also implement the catalog, right? So, so this is the first question that I, I, I want to be very, uh, answer very clearly. Yeah, you know, I was, I was, in the, I was at the presenting at the Nordic conference last week, and I was surprised somebody said to me, why, why, why are you requiring us to implement IMS Managed ACBs. And again, the, the answer is because it's the infrastructure that will allow us to implement IMS DDL, right? Now, why DDL? Why are we going that route? Well, here is how we gen database related control blocks in IMS, right? You, you code up your PSBs and assembler macros, then you use a PSB gen utility to gen that PSB into the PSB library. You code up your DBD uh, in, in assembler <clears throat> macros, you use the DBD gen utility, and you gen that into DBD library. And then for the online system, typically you do what's called an ACB gen, and we, we pre-build these ACB blocks 
uh, into the ACB library. And that's what IMS uses in the online system to process calls to databases. Now, we've been doing this since 1968. The, the question that I always throw out is why? Why do we do this? Why do we pre-build PSB, DBD blocks and ACB blocks when no other database system does that? DB2 doesn't do that. MySQL doesn't do that. Why in IMS do we do this? And the answer is, if you look at the history, you know, IMS came out in 1968. Well, the processors that we had in 1968 were, were not that fast. Nothing uh, for me. The, 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 the DASD uh, uh, storage, the main storage, right? That was not so abundantly available. It was not cheaply available. And so the developers of IMS knew that because the processes were not fast, because storage wasn't that abundantly available, that they needed to do things to make sure that IMS performs really well, right? And this is why we pre-build these runtime blocks so that when IMS is running, it can run really, 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 really fast. And, and even today, um, you know, the DB2 folks, after they've had a couple of beers, they, they'll say, they'll admit, oh, God damn, that IMS is still fast, right? And that's because we pre-build these blocks. The problem with this approach is this. Uh, first of all, the input, the PSB, the DVD, the, it's coded in assembler macros. Uh, less and less uh, people are learning about assembler. Uh, and IMS is viewed as this complex product, right? And now, you know, a lot of us, a lot of us, uh, I won't say older, but I'll say experienced folks are, are getting close to retirement. And there's a there's a younger generation of IMSers that are coming on the scene and, and, and we need to make IMS simple for them. And that's why the future of IMS is to get rid of all those gens, get rid of PSP gens, get rid of DBD gens, get rid of ACB gens, and simply code up DDL, submit DDL, we'll process the DDL. Under the covers, we'll still create the ACB blocks, right? Because we still want IMS to run fast like it does. So under the covers, when we process those DDL statements, we'll create the uh, ACB blocks, we'll put them in the directory data set, and then we'll take that same information, we'll decode it and put it in the catalog so it can be used for Java programs that are accessing IMS databases, right? So this is the future of IMS. This is where we wanna go. And it is because of this that we are trying to uh, get folks to implement IMS managed ACBs. IMS managed ACBs is the infrastructure that will allow you to do this so that we can get rid of those gens, uh, PSB gens, ACB gens, DBD gens, and so on, right? Here on this page, this is a very nice page. This is actually put together by one of our clients. His name is Robert Recknagel. Um, and on the left-hand side, you see a sample DBD. Uh, this is a root-only HIDAM database. Uh, on the left-hand side, on the top is the root DBD. And at the bottom on the left-hand side is the index uh, DBD, right? This is coded in assembler macros. Now, those of us that have been doing this for a while, uh, we know this, we understand this, it's simple. But, but again, the, the new folks, the folks that are just coming out of college, that are getting started in IMS, for them, this is like Greek. They're like, what is this stuff, right? Assembler, macros, what's SEGM, what's field, L child? They don't quite get it. Uh, on the right-hand side, the same DBD is now coded uh, using DDL. So if we were to define that same database using DDL, uh, I've coded this. And, and by the way, it's color-coded. So you can see the equivalent DDL statement for, uh, for the macro that you've coded in your DBD. So instead of coding DBD name equals IVP DB D1, right? You can say create database. And then the name of the data database is IVP DB1, access HIDAM OSAM, right? Uh, data sets are called table spaces uh, because that's the nomenclature, that's the terminology they use in, in relational terminology. Uh, so we well, in, in DDL, we say create table space. And the DD name is DFSIVD1, 
in, and the name of the database is IVPDB1. And then it's primary size, a block size or CI size is 2048. Segments are basically tables. So you'd say create table. And within that table, you'd have the names of the various fields or columns, if you will, right? So, so that's just to whet your appetite, if you will. Uh, that's showing you how, you know, you code your DBDs today in assembler macros, and this is what it would look like if you were to code it in DDL. And that's where we headed. That's the direction that we headed in. Any questions or comments? There's, there's stuff in the chat, Amanda. Are they, is it questions? Some comments, um, but no direct questions. Okay, good. All right. Okay, continuing on. So why IMS manage ACBs? What is it about this infrastructure that we need this for DDL? Well, IMS manage ACBs provides a robust infrastructure for DDL. Uh, and, and what do we mean by robust infrastructure for DDL? In a non-IMS managed ACB environment, this is what you've got today. You may optionally implement the catalog. So you've got the catalog partition data sets. Uh, you, there's one secondary index on the catalog. You can partition that too. So, so that's optional. You may or may not have that today in a non-IMS managed ACB environment. And then what you've got is you've got ACB Live A and ACB Live B, and you've got a staging ACB library. And at any given point in time, uh, you know, either ACB Live A or ACB Live B is being used. So one is active and one is inactive, right? And this is a non-IMS managed ACB environment. I think I think you're all aware of this. Uh, Those have, ACB, yeah, I question, do have a question. Go ahead. I do have a question. Do you have a utility that gives the DDL to IMS? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, that's that's why I'd stop there to see if anybody had questions. Yes. So, so you, you, we do have a utility. There's the uh, DDL batch generation utility that can take your libraries as input and then, uh, you know, generate the DDL for you. Uh, or that utility can read the catalog and generate DDL uh, for you. We also in IMS Explorer for development, uh, when you're looking at a DVD, there's a radio button. You just click that radio button and. And, and, you know, boom, right there and then it's, it's, it spits out the DDL, the equivalent DDL for you. So, so that's not an issue. We, we took care of that a long time ago. Yeah, yes, absolutely. You can take an existing DVD or a PSP that somebody might have coded, let's say, I don't know, 1976. They have retired, probably, maybe, maybe they're dead by now. But we can take that PSP or DVD. And, and we can give you the equivalent DDL for it. Absolutely, yeah, right? Okay, great, yeah, please keep those questions coming. So ACB Libs, uh, we don't think they're robust. ACB Libs are, are PDSs, partition data sets. Uh, PDSs, as you know, uh, need to be compressed to reclaim space. So if you delete members, that space isn't reclaimed until you compress the PDS. PDSs can fill up. Uh, we've seen instances where PDSs have gotten corrupted if, if a job uh, ab ends, right? So, so ACB lives are not robust. Um, and, and so we want to replace the ACB lives, those PDSs, with PDSEs, right? Uh, PDSEs have, have several benefits, and I've listed them here. Uh, PDSEs use dynamic space allocation and they automatically reclaim space, so you don't have to do a manual compression. Uh, PDSEs allow up to 123 extents, whereas in a PDS, you can only get 16 extents. The maximum size of a PDSE member is you know, roughly uh, 15 million records. Maximum number of PDSE members, 522,000, right? Uh, so, so PDSs can be huge, uh, and, and then, all updates to a PDSE are atomic, unlike a traditional PDS. So canceled jobs or system crashes will not corrupt a PDSE. And of course, PDSEs can be shared across the suspects. So, so there are a lot of benefits with a PDSE. So what we did was in, in IMS managed ACB environment, we said, okay, let's take these ACB live PDSs, let's make them PDSEs, and let's give them a name. 
call it IMS directory, right? <laughs> it's, it sounds impressive, right? Um, and, and also we decided that we would not have an active directory and an inactive directory. No, we would actually have uh, multiple active directory data sets. Uh, so we start you off with when you implement IMS many ACBs, you have two IMS active directory data sets. So your ACB lives are spread out across those two active directory data sets. If you need more, IMS will automatically create a new one. Uh, if that third one fills up and you need a fourth one, we'll automatically create a fourth one. Uh, this is a this, this, this idea of automatically allocating a directory data sets if you need them. Uh, that's a roadmap item and, and, and we, we plan on delivering that. And because you can have multiple active directory data sets, we keep track about these active directory data sets in a data set called the BSDS, a bootstrap data set, right? The, in DB2, by the way, if you have DB2 background, DB2 has a bootstrap data set, but that bootstrap data set is used uh, to keep track of DB2 logs. We keep track of the directory data sets uh, via the BSDS. That's the difference between our BSDS and, and, and DB2's BSDS. So this, when you implement IMS managed ACBs, this, these are the components that you will have in place. The catalog is no longer optional. You have to implement the catalog. So you'll have the catalog partition data sets. You'll have the secondary index data sets. You have the directory data sets. We'll start you off with two. Uh, if you need more, then we'll, we can automatically allocate a, a new directory data set. Uh, we have a staging directory data set, which is very much like a staging ACB library, right? So when you, when you create a new ACB block, you'll put in the staging directory data set, and then you will import into the active directory data sets via the online change process. And then we have the bootstrap data set, and, and that's there to keep track of our directory data sets, right? So these are the components, if you will, of an IMS managed ACB environment. Uh, when you implement IMS managed ACBs, these components will come into play, okay? Deepak, we um, have two questions that popped up. Thank uh, you. What does it require to manage IMS catalogs? Ah, uh, so what is required in managing an IMS catalog? So, so I'll, I'll cover that in the, in the next presentation that I'm gonna do. But for now, let me answer your question. Thank you for asking that question. Um, the catalog, first of all, is a database. It's a HALDB database, right? So it has to be managed like any other database, which is, you know, periodically, you're going to run your point of checker, make sure that the, the database is healthy. Periodically, you're going to take backups of the database, uh, of the catalog, so that if the catalog takes a hit, then you can recover the catalog, right? Uh, those are some of the standard things that you have to do to manage the catalog. There's one other thing that, that, that I'll talk about later, um, which is that every time you do an ACB gen, uh, we add an instance of that ACB uh, information into the catalog. So for example, if I have a database called XYZ, right? The name of my database is XYZ, and you do an ACB gen for database XYZ, we'll create an instance of XYZ in the catalog. If you do another ACB gen, we'll create a second instance. If you do a third ACB gen, we'll create a third instance. So the more ACB gens you do, the more instances we put in the catalog. So after some time, you have to run a utility. It's called the IMS catalog purge utility, which has to go in and, and delete the older instances from the catalog, right? So that's part of managing the IMS catalog also, okay? Uh, so those are the things that you have to do as part of managing the IMS catalog. I hope that addresses your question. If and not, it, come back, please ask questions, right? Or go are, off mute and ask questions. There are two other questions um, that had popped up. One mm -hmm. is from, how can I organize the sizing for the catalog and directory files? Very good, uh, nice question. How can I size my, my catalog and directory? So remember, what goes into the catalog is, is mostly your DVD 
and your PSV information. Uh, and and the there's a utility called the catalog populate utility that gets the that reads your ACBs and then populates the catalog with that information. And one of the uh, features of the catalog populate utility is you can tell it to uh, read the ACB library uh, only just just read it. You know, it, it's like running the catalog populate utility in the, in analysis mode. It'll read the ACB library and then it'll based on just that alone will say this is how big you want to make your catalog. So it'll give you uh, some idea of, of sizing. Now, what we recommend is you take that sizing um, suggestion recommendation that the catalog populate utility gives you, you, you take that and then you add another 500% to that and, and use that as your size for the catalog, right? Um, and the reason we say 500% is because, you know, at some place as, as, and down the road, you might want to import COBOL copybooks. Uh, and, and so that'll take up some room uh, in the catalog. Um, and then of course the catalog will grow and change over time. Well, we saw that with the DB2 catalog and, and that'll happen with, with the IMIS catalog also. So that's how you would come up with the size for the catalog. For the directory, I would take the size that you've got for your ACB libraries. And that's a good place to get started uh, for, your, for your directory data sets. Yeah. Did I address that question? Is are the other questions, Amanda? There are two other questions. So Eric asked, does the IMS catalog CalDB database have to be registered with DBRC? Great question. Wonderful. Thank you, Eric, for asking that question. So HALDBs have to be registered with DBRC. Now, one of the reasons not everybody uses HALDB is because when we introduced HALDB, and I believe we introduced HALDB back in version 7 of IMS, one of the reasons that people didn't use HALDBs, not everybody uses HALDBs, is because they said, oh, HALDBs have to be registered with DBRC. In, in, in test and development, we don't turn on DBRC. We don't care if a database crashes because we'll just restore it with an image copy. It's test, it's development. So I don't want to turn on DBRC in development, right? So we knew that when we picked, when we designed the catalog to be a HALDB database, uh, what we did was we gave you an option where you can, you can make the, your catalog as an unregistered catalog. So, so the answer to Eric's question is there's an option where you can create a catalog and, and not register with DBRC, and you can define that catalog as an unregistered catalog. And, and there are some steps to do that. Now, we, we certainly gave you that option, but uh, we don't suggest you do that in production. We don't see anybody doing that in production, uh, but, but certainly in test and development, that's, you, could, you could have an unregistered catalog, meaning you don't have to register with DBRC. So that's my answer to Eric's question. What was the other question, Amanda? Is it mandatory to define an IMS catalog in IMS 14 onwards? No, the catalog is optional even today, even with 15.5 that just became GA, right? Uh, about a week ago, we, we GA'd 15.5. Even with 15.5, the latest release of IMS, the catalog is optional. Now, next year, when we come out with a new release of IMS and you want to migrate to that new release of IMS, you have to implement IMS managed ACBs. And as part of that implementation, you have to implement the catalog. The other place where you have to implement the catalog is if you're writing Java programs that access IMS databases, then you have to implement the catalog. If you're going to start using DDL, if you're going to start using DDL or playing with DDL, you have to implement the catalog, right? Those are the instances where you have to implement the catalog. I, I hope that answers your question. If not, please come back uh, with, with another question. That's all the Any questions other? we have. Are we good? No more questions? We're good. And that did answer that last question, so, right? Okay, great. Um, so, so, so let's talk about directories and, and ACB Live and see what the difference is. The directory, as I mentioned, is a PDSC. The ACB Live is a PDS. 
the directory is just, and, and, and I say this uh, frankly, uh, you know, without any hesitation, when, when you're talking about directories, think ACB lives, right? Uh, because directories house ACB lives, just like an ACB live houses ACBs, right? Directories house ACBs. The directory records have a format much like the ACBs in an ACB library. So in other words, what we are saying is the ACB blocks, did the blocks themselves, they didn't change, uh, even though we, we are calling it the directory data sets. So, and the directory has a functionality that's similar to an ACB library, which means when you start up an IMS control region or an IMS online region, it'll reference the directory to get the runtime ACB blocks. Now, what's the difference? They, they all seem the same. What's the difference? Well, here are, here are a couple of differences. GSAM databases, right? Today, GSAM database control blocks, they reside in the DVD library. They're not in the ACB library. Right, with IMS managed of ACBs, GSAM DVDs will also be stored in the directory. And why do we do that? Why are we storing GSAM DVDs in a directory that houses ACBs? Right, and, and the reason is because one day, DVD gens, PSV gens, ACB gens that all go away. So will the DVD lives. So will the PSV lives. IMS will not need them, and if GSAM DVDs are in the DVD library. When those libraries go away, what, where, where do GSAM DVDs go? So that's why we're putting GSAM DVDs in the directory also. So IMS will use the directory to load the GSAM runtime control box uh, for each dependent region schedule. Logical DVDs also today, logical DVDs, if you're using logical databases, logical DVDs are stored in the DVD library. They're not stored in the ACB library. With IMS management of ACBs, logical DVDs today are stored in the catalog, but they are not yet stored in the directory. But we've started this work and this work is in progress and, and we are almost uh, completing this now where logical DVDs will also be stored in the directory data set. Okay, all right, so so I, I've introduced you to the components of an IMS managed ACB environment. Uh, I've talked about the directory data sets. Uh, let's say you implement IMS managed ACBs. What's impacted? What changes when you implement IMS managed ACBs? Well, here's, here's the one big change with IMS managed ACBs. ACB gen changes, right? Uh, and online change for ACBs changes. Right, online change for format library, online change for mod blocks, that does not change, right? So online change for format library, mod blocks, you would still use the, you know, the slash modify prepare and the slash modify commit, but online change for ACBs will change once you implement IMS managed ACBs, right? So, so let's talk about these two things, ACB gen. This is your traditional ACB gen process, right? PSB gen to the PSB library, DVD gen to the DVD library. And then you use the ACB gen utility, DFSU ACB zero, and you put the ACB blocks in the staging ACB library, right? So we've been doing this for quite some time. The ACB gen process in an IMS managed ACB environment is going to be a little different. In an IMS managed ACB environment, remember, You've got the staging directory data set where the ACB blocks will be placed, but you also have the catalog. And both the catalog and the staging directory data sets have to be kept in sync. So, so you would still do the PSB gen into the PSB library. You would still do the DBD gen into the DBD library. When you do the ACB gen, we have introduced a new utility. It's called DFS3 UACB. And what that ACB gen utility will do is it'll use the ACB library that you've got today uh, as your trusted ACB library. It'll perform an ACB gen and the ACB block will be placed in the ACB library. It'll put the ACB block in the staging directory data set. And then the ACB gen utility under the covers will invoke the catalog populate utility to take that ACB block, decode it and put it in the catalog. This way, both the catalog and the staging directory are in sync, 
right? So this is one way you can do an ACB gen once you've implemented IMS managed ACBs. You would run this utility called DFS3 UACB and under the covers, it'll invoke the ACB gen utility to do the ACB gen and that ACB block gets placed in the ACB library in the staging directory. And then under the covers, it'll invoke the catalog populate utility and the catalog populate utility will then uh, take that ACB block, decode it, and put that same information into the catalog. So this is one way that you can do an ACB gen in an IMS managed ACB environment. The other way is you could say, you know what? I'm not going to use that DFS3 UACB utility. I'm actually going to do the, those two steps that that utility does. I'm going to do them separately. So you could use the, so what you would do is you would run the, the, the old ACB gen utility, which will do an ACB gen and up, put the ACB block in the ACB library. And it'll also, in, in the JCL for the old ACB gen utility, you'll specify an ACB cat work data set. And in that data set, it'll specify which blocks it has done an ACB gen for. And then uh, you would have this utility, after this utility, you run the catalog populate utility, the catalog populate utility will take as input that ACB cat work data set. It'll know which blocks were gen and it'll put those blocks in the staging directory data set. And then it'll decode those ACB blocks and put them in the catalog database, right? So this is another way that you can do an ACB gen in an IMS managed ACB environment. Any questions on this? Two questions that came in. Um, will the GSAM transfer be done automatically or is it a manual step? No, it's automatic. Great. So when you populate, when you when you populate uh, the catalog, the GSM DVDs will go in there also. Yeah. And how are IMS batch jobs managed? In an I yeah. So that's coming up. So just just uh, I've got a slide on 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 IMS batch jobs, DLI batch jobs in an IMS managed ACP environment. Okay. Thanks. Any questions? Okay, since you all understand this, let me ask you a question. I, I said there's two ways to do an ACB gen. You could run the DFS3 UACB utility, or you could run the two utilities separately. You know, you could run the ACB gen followed by the catalog populate. Those are the two ways. Why are there two ways? Why would you want to use maybe this two-step process over the previous uh, one-step DFS3 or one job DFS to UACB. You understand the question? Anybody want to go off mute and take a shot at that? Everybody's shy. Maybe it doesn't have to be an immediate impact or like immediate changes in effect. I'm not sure what you mean by that, but but the the, the uh, reason uh, is the reason is this. Um, if this, if I do it, if I do this by running this one job with DFS3 UACB and it abends for, for whatever reason, I'm not, it's not clear, especially with automation, it's not clear what, what, where the abend was. Was it in the ACB gen step or was it in the catalog populate step? Right? So, so we have some clients. That, that did not want, that said, you know, I don't know, you know, when I run this DFS3 UACB, if something happens, if, if there's an ab and I don't know which part ab ended. Under the covers, yes, it does the ACB gen and then it invokes the catalog populate utility. But if I've got automation, all automation knows is we got an ab end. I don't know if the ab end was in ACB gen or if it's in the catalog populate utility. And so they want to be more, you know, uh, specific and so they do this they have a separate job that runs the acb gen with the acb cat work specified and then they run the catalog populate utility right so so that's why you might want to run them separately that's entirely up to you okay See, okay Pat, uh before yeah. you move on if you will check the chat um yeah. there were two questions starting with jade's question and um, I'm sorry, there's four total questions now, but starting with Jade's questions about, um, did he show the PSB DVD source where it's DDL? 
or where is the DDL? I'm scrolling down. Okay, this a PSB slash DVD DDL is a separate topic. I don't, I don't, oh, there's Jade. Okay, there is. Um, all right, uh, these show PSB DVD source. Where is the DDL? These show PSB DVD source. Where is the DDL? I'm not sure I understand your question. I, I believe I believe you're I believe you're showing them how to convert the existing PSB and DVDs. It's not going into defining PSBs and DVDs dynamically with DDL. But the the, uh, the DDL will also go to the catalog, right? Right, right. When, when you when you submit DDL, we'll process the DDL. And under the covers, we'll create um, under the covers, we'll create the the ACB block. We'll put in the directory, and then we'll say, put that same information into the catalog. Is, is the question? Yeah. Uh, hi. So in the diagrams, you said PSP source and DVD source. Is that the old source that we have now, or is that yeah a one-time one conversion? I'm not understanding. Yeah, you could do that. Yes, you could. You yeah. Okay, so that's Jade. Thanks, Jade. Yeah. For hi. Here. Yeah, so, so yes, you can take your PSB DVD source libraries, right, and feed them into the DDL batch generation utility, and it'll generate the DDL source for you. Does that make okay. sense? Yes. Did I answer your question? Yes, you did. Thanks. Now, if you, if you don't have the source, for example, but you were able to create the catalog from the ACB libraries, you can run the DDL batch generation utility against the catalog and it'll read the catalog and it'll generate DDL source for you. Did, did, did that help? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yep, that clears okay. it up too. Um, uh, I'm, I'm looking at the, 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 the chat. Uh, Heike said, is there a rollback if a utility crashes? Uh, no, no, there isn't. Uh, in, in the case of DFS3 UACB, the, there isn't. Um, ben Richardson, if I am running high performance ACB from IMS tools, do I need to wait for Rocket to catch up or will they be in step with 15.6? Actually, uh, all of our vendors, uh, BMC, Rocket, uh, they have all been uh, up to speed. Uh, in fact, if there's any tool uh, that doesn't run uh, in an IMS managed ACB environment, uh, they would have that documented. Uh, Tracy Dean is the uh, program uh, product manager for tools. And so uh, they're, they're pretty current, I would say. Uh, Nancy Campbell to phase the implementation. I didn't understand what Nancy Campbell said to phase the implementation. Um, and then John Schlatweiler says, PSB, DDL, DBD, DDL is a separate topic. Is the PSB, DBD source written as DDL or is it same as now? I think we, we, we covered Jade's question. Nancy, Campbell, that was a wrong answer to the question of why use the two-step process instead of the one-step process. I'm not sure what you mean by that, Nancy. Do you wanna do you wanna jump or do you wanna get off mute and, and talk? Nancy, if you're able to get off mute. Oh, she said never mind. Okay. Yeah, I, right. I, I just when you ask the question, put in the chat why would we use the one step versus the two step? That was my answer, and it was wrong. Okay. Okay. 
All right, feel free to, uh, yeah, feel free to go off mute and jump in if you like, please. Might be easier. Okay, so we talked about ACB gens. Let's talk about online change, shall we? Online change today without IMS managed ACBs, this is what you do today um, if you do online change, right? You do an ACB gen into the staging ACB library. Then you copy from the staging ACB library to the inactive ACB library, you know, the, the A or the B, whichever is inactive, you copy it there. Then you tell IMS, hey, IMS, I want you to switch the libraries. I want you to make the inactive the active and make the active the inactive. And the way you do that is you enter two commands. You enter the slash modify prepare command where you're telling IMS, hey, you know, I want to switch the libraries, uh, uh, you know, get ready to do that, prepare to do that. And then you enter a second command, you say slash modify commit, right? Uh, and, and that tells IMS, go ahead and, and do the switch. Now, if for some reason the modify commit fails, and typically it fails because you're trying to, uh, because there's a resource that's in use that you're trying to change, right? Uh, if the modify commit fails, then you got to figure out what resource was in use. And so you enter a third command. You do a slash display modify to figure out why online change failed, right? So, it's a, so you first got to copy the stuff to the inactive. Then you got to enter two commands. And if that fails, you got to enter a third command to figure out why it failed. This is what you do today. This is what we've been doing for online change for decades. And then you're all probably all familiar with this. If you do online change, there are some clients, by the way, that don't do online change. They have the luxury IMS comes down at five in the evening and then they make the changes, you know, uh, but, so they don't do online change. But for those that do online change, this is the process. We've been doing this for decades. We all know this, right? Yeah, okay. So in an IMS managed ACB environment, you would do the ACB gen into the staging directory data set. And then to bring it online, what you wanna do is, you, you, you the, the, this is a type two command. It's called the import definition source catalog command. It's the import command. And that import command will take your ACB block from this staging directory and bring it into one of the directory data sets. Remember, both are active. It's not that one is active and one is inactive, right? So, so when you enter the import command, it'll take that ACB block and then bring it in to one of the directory data sets. And, and, and that's how an ACB gen, uh, that's how an online change for an ACB block is done in an IMS managed ACB environment. So, so you don't have to copy it from the staging directory to the inactive. You don't have to do that. You don't have to enter two commands that say, you know, modify, prepare, modify, commit. No, you enter one command, import, and it'll import that ACB block. If the import fails because the resource is in use, for example, the import command will tell you. It'll tell you why it failed, right? Uh, and, and so that's the beauty of the online change in an IMS managed ACB environment, right? They were trying to make it simple. Enter one command, boom, you're done, right? Uh, now the import command is a type two command. There's no type one equivalent of it, right? So that means that You've got to have an SCI address space up and running. You've got to have an OM address space up and running. And then you're going to enter type two commands from possibly a Spark, right? Now, if the catalog is shared between multiple IMS systems, then not only do you have to have SCI, OM, but you also have the resource manager address space up and running, right? So, Deepak, yeah, go ahead. Can I interrupt? Yeah, yeah go ahead, Karen. The previous slide, when you do the import, yeah. does that quiesce the resources that are referenced in that uh, yeah. ACB as prior to moving it into the active directories? So, so yeah, yeah. Okay, I'm, thank you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a little more detail on that. It, 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 yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm going to get into that thank just you. now. I think I have it on the next page. No, I don't have it on the next page. No, I left it out. Um, and, but, and but yes. So, the, so those resources cannot be in use. So if you're making, so, so for example, 
if you're making a DBD change and you do a DBD gen and an ACB gen, let me go back to the previous page, right? And so now that DVD block is, or DMB block is sitting in the staging directory data set and you want to import that, you know, you would have to stop that database. And if you don't, the import will fail. Did I answer your question, Karen? Uh, yes, but why do I have to stop it? Yeah, <laughs> because it may, it may be a while before you know, uh, is, is so I, I have, I have to do, uh, that's right. You have to DBR the database, database but... access, stop access first right. before right. I do an import. Before you do an import, otherwise. Import okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, right. and Deepak, there are a couple of questions that have come in. Uh, Shandon, Shandon says, does converting to IMS catalog have any performance implications that we should be aware of? Great. So, so yeah, let, let me address Shandon's question. Uh, converting to IMS catalog have any performance implications that we should be concerned about? No. Uh, catalog is used for what purposes? Let, let's go through that, Shandon. I'm glad you're asking these questions because uh, I, I want to point, point out some of these important things. Catalog is used if you're writing Java programs that access IMS databases. Otherwise, the catalog itself is not used by IMS. If you are doing DDL, then we would use the catalog because we've got to update the catalog when you submit DDL. Otherwise, IMS doesn't use the catalog, right? So converting to IMS catalog has no performance implications. In fact, and then I'll go one step further Let's say the catalog takes a hit. Let's say there's an IO error against the catalog. Does IMS crash? No, it doesn't. Catalog is a database. You could take it offline. You could DBR the catalog. Does IMS crash? No, right? But if you take the data, if they take the catalog offline and you've got Java programs that are trying to access IMS databases, well, they won't be successful. But IMS will continue to run, right? So, so I hope I answered uh, Chandan's question. Uh, Mike uh, Brawler, Brawler, sorry if I mispronounced your name. It says, if I import ACB1 today, then do it again next day, week, a year, will it always go into the same directory data set? Yes. Yes, Mike. So, so Mike's question is a very good question, Mike. I, like, I love it. He says, I've got, a, I've got a, a, an ACB block called ACB1, and it's in, it's in one directory data set, right? Next time I do an ACB gen for that same block, is it going to go to the same directory data set? And the answer is yes. Uh, DOP PSV. Carlos is asking about DOP PSV, and I didn't cover that. Uh, I'm going to have a separate uh, um, blog on, uh, on DOP PSV. Uh, I'm actually putting that together today. In, in fact, there was another client that asked for it, and I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, send that to him too. So Carlos, uh, uh, for DOPS, uh, th there are some special things you have to do, and uh, and we'll, we'll we'll put out a blog on that, or or, or I'll have another session on that. Right. Um, ben Richardson, I DBR in order to unload load ACB Gen start database. Still use a DB line to the unload lead on. Yes, you no, you you don't have to use the DBD live, but you could if you want to, Ben, to do the unload reload. Okay. For unload reload, uh, you can have the have them use the directory data sets also, or you could use the DBD live. Okay, let me let me go further. Um, question, oh, go ahead. Paul Wagel here. Hi, Paul. Go ahead. Um, you mentioned that there's no performance impact with the catalog. What about yeah. with the directory itself? No, they're, yeah, they're, they're great. Thanks, thanks, Paul, for asking that. Uh, is there a performance impact with the directory? Nope. No, imp no performance impact with the directory. When you run an IMS transaction, for example, that runs in a message processing region, the ACB blocks have to be in memory. If they're not, 
we typically go out to the ACB library and bring them in. Here, we'll go out to the uh, directory and bring them in. Okay. So, uh, good, Thank, thanks for jumping in, yep. Okay, so, so the type two command requires SCI and OM, and if you're sharing the catalog, you must have an RM. So, so you need these uh, SCI, uh, you, you need these address spaces up and running. And this should also tell you one more thing that I, that I should have listed on here, is that because it's a type two command, because we're using these CSL address spaces, right? your IMS system must be defined as an IMS plex. So if you're one of those uh, you know, small clients that have one IMS system in production today, it's not defined as a plex. Well, you're going to have to, that's one of the changes you're going to have to do is you're going to have to define your one IMS system. So you're going to define that plex as a pl IMS plex with just one IMS system, right? The import basically does a, it doesn't do a move, but it, it does the equivalent of a move of, of taking those blocks from staging directory and moving them to the active directory. The import command is import definition source catalog. That's the format of the command. When you enter the command in that way, it takes everything from staging and puts it in the Active Directory data set. Now, if you want to pick and choose, you want to pull in just one PSB from the staging, not everything, then there's a name parameter that you can use on the import command. So you'll say import definition source catalog name, and then you'll name the PSB or the DMB that you want to bring in. On the name parameter, you can also use wildcards, right? Uh, and there's a performance impact of doing this when you use wild, uh, wild cards. And then, as I mentioned, you know, the whole idea behind this design was a single process, right? You enter one command, boom, it either completes or if it doesn't, it tells you what the issue is. Not, you know, you know, not. There's no such thing as copying to the inactive library and then you know, doing the modify, prepare, one command, modify, commit, two commands. No, it's a single command. And then if the import is successful, whatever we import into the directory is logged in the 7002 log record. We have the name of the resource that was changed or added. Okay. Now there's a lot more to this than meets the eye, by the way. I have a whole presentation on on, on just the import command, right? Um, and, and so, but, but you know, you can't boil the ocean. I, I'm, I'm trying to at least give you a, a nice overview, a good understanding of, okay, if I implement IMS managed ACB, how am I impacted? Well, you're impacted because ACB gens are going to be different. The online change process is going to be different, right? Um, and, and the other thing I should have added on here is, is, is um, is DOP PSBs, but I'm I'm putting that stuff together today, um, and 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 we'll put it out as a blog, and then maybe we'll do some sessions on that just to make sure that everybody's clear on that. Okay, let's talk about DLI batch jobs. So you've implemented IMS managed ACBs. What does this mean for your DLI batch jobs? Well, your DLI batch jobs do not have to be modified for IMS managed ACBs. They can kill, they can continue to run with DBD lives and PSB lives, right? You so so in fact, I this is what I tell clients if you're implementing IMS managed ACBs, go ahead and do that. Leave your DLI batch jobs alone, right? Let let them reference the DBD lives and PSB lives. Now, once the dust has settled, you're comfortable, you now also want your DLI batch jobs to be enabled for IMS managed ACBs. In other words, you don't want them to use DBD lives, PSP lives. You've got two options. You can go into the JCL for each DLI batch job, right? And in the JCL on the PARM statement, you can specify the suffix of the DFSDF Proclide member. This is the Proclide member where, you know, there are parameters relating to IMS managed ACBs and the catalog, they're all defined in this DS, DF, DF Proclide member. So, so one option is you could go into the DLI batch job GCL 
And for every DLI batch job on the PARM statement, specify the suffix of the DFSDF Proclide member. When that batch job runs, IMS will go to this Proclide member. It'll see that you've got IMS managed ACB set up and it'll get that information from the directory data sets. And it, the DVD lives and PSP lives will be ignored. But this is a lot of work, right? I mean, you may have 400 DLI batch jobs. You've got to modify every DLI batch job. Then because you've modified it, you now have to, to you, because you've modified the JCL, you now have to test it, you know? So this is a lot of work. So to, to, to help with that migration to an IMS managed ACB environment, we provided an exit routine. The exit routine is DFS three CDX zero, right? And so you can code up this exit routine, you know, put it in your res live, and, and now you don't have to modify your, your JCL for your DLI batch jobs, and your DLI batch jobs will reference that information from the catalog of the directory data sets, right? Uh, and if you've got DVD live, PSB live, ACB lives uh, in your JCL, we'll just ignore that. Right. So, so this is the implication for your DLI batch jobs. Deepak, I see stuff happening on the on the chat. Yeah, I, I was going to pull your attention to Eric's question. Yeah, uh, great, great question, Eric. Thank you. Eric is saying, yeah, you're talking about DLI batch jobs, which on the PARM statement have DLI. What if I've got a bat batch job that's got DBB and it's using the ACB live instead of DLI? Uh, using DB, DVD Live and PSV Live. Yeah, absolutely, Eric. And, and there are clients that do that. They've got the batch jobs that with DBB. And that's okay. Even there, you know, if they're using an ACB Live and you're keeping that ACB Live up to date, they can continue to use ACB libraries. But when you want to migrate, uh, you can either modify the JCL and specify the suffix for DFS, DF proc Live member, or you can use that exit routine, okay? And then K. Rowe says, near future, can I dream macro DFS3 cat Q will generate DVD PSV source uh, from DFS CD triple um, zero? So K. Rowe is asking a different question that I haven't covered. We have an API application programming interface. And, and, uh, and the macro for that API is DFS3 CAT Q, DFS3 CAT Q. So that's an API. Uh, a lot of our vendors are using that. And, and some clients that have got homegrown programs that read ACB library, well, those clients can use DFS3 CAT Q which is that 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 API and and get that same information from the directory data set. Uh, uh, though now that K Rowe has brought this up, uh, I'll just mention this that 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 macro DFS three cat Q that API we call it the catalog API, but it's not really the catalog API. It's an API to read the directory data set. Right? Why didn't we call it the directory API? <laughs> because then maybe you'd understand. I, I you know, it, it's crazy. Uh, we should have called it the directory API, but we call it the catalog API, but it doesn't read the catalog. It reads the directory data set, right? Okay. Um, and then uh, there was another question. Need IMS 15.3 for this to work with file aid and IMS... 21.1? Oh, file aid. Um, I don't know, Robert. Uh, we'd have to check with the file aid folks. Uh, yeah, I was just letting you know because we tried to implement it with 15.2 and it didn't work. So we just have to go up to... What didn't work with 15.2? The exit that you write to override for programs. It was creating an error for them. Oh, Robert, then, then, then you should... Uh... You should open a case. Well, well, from file aid standpoint, that's what they said. We didn't. We needed fifteen point three. We're just on fifteen. Oh, okay. 
Uh, I'll, I'll look into that. I wasn't aware of that. Okay. So Robert's saying is to use the DFC cat key, you need IMS 15.3. Okay, good. I, I, I'll, I'll look into that. Yeah. Okay. So, so um, that's about daylight bat jobs. And then what are we currently working on? There's, there's a utility called the catalog maintenance utility, uh, which will allow you to make changes to the IMS catalog without an outage. And, and there's two things that this utility does. You might find data in the catalog that needs to be changed, or you might want to make a structural change to the catalog, right? And, and we understand that the catalog is going to become central to your database uh, functions uh, at some point, right? Especially when DDL is required, you got to have the catalog. We can't have the catalog, uh, you know, offline. And, and so, and we also understand that over time, the catalog is going to grow and change. And so we are developing a utility called the catalog maintenance utility that will allow you to make changes to the catalog uh, and you'll be able to do it without taking the catalog offline. We've already given beta code to our sponsor users and, and we are working with them and they're providing feedback on this, but, but this is a pretty exciting utility uh, when it becomes available. Now you will not make changes to the catalog on your own. L let me make that clear. Uh, if we decided that there's a new segment that needs to be placed into the catalog, then we would put out an APAR and a PTF and would say, hey, you've got to add this new segment to the catalog. But in order to do that, use this utility, the catalog maintenance utility. So whenever changes need to be made, you will use this utility and hopefully you'll be able to do it without an outage, uh, without taking the utility, the catalog offline, okay? We have also been diligently going through every IMS utility and making sure it works with IMS managed ACBs. Uh, the, uh, and I, I believe we, we had a list of about 70, roughly 70 IMS utilities. Every one of them, we were going through the list. And, 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 and a few weeks ago, I was told that there was only two more that they had to test. So, so this is proceeding very well, making sure that every IMS utility uh, can run in an IMS managed ACB environment. And then I already mentioned logical DVDs are being placed in the IMS directory data set, right? This work has begun and, and it's, and we're nearing the end of this. So, so this is being done. The import command that I talked about, the, there, there are a couple of things uh, that we are still uh, working on. There are some issues. So I wanna point them out, you know, just to be transparent, I wanna point them out to you. Um, here are some of those things. When you issue an import command, and if you're importing lots of resources, you know, maybe you're importing a thousand PSBs, for example, right? When the import is running, there's no progress. There's no heartbeat message. So you issue an import command and maybe it's importing a lot of resources. Maybe it's importing a thousand PSBs. You don't know. You don't know if the import command is hung. You don't know if it's still working. So, so that's one of the things that our, our sponsor users, our clients that have been playing with this stuff, they've come back and said, you know, you, you got to give us some sort of a progress message or a heartbeat message that says, hey, I'm still here. I'm not hung. I'm working on this, right? Uh, and, and we thought that's a reasonable request. And so, so we have that on our roadmap to, to make sure that when you issue the import command to come back with some heartbeat messages that tell you, yeah, we're we're still working, we're still doing this, right? So, so that's another thing. The other question that some of our clients have brought up about the import command is this. They're saying, you know, there's nothing like a display modify, meaning I have to issue the import command and then it fails and tells me it failed because this resource is in use. There's no way for me to check ahead, right? In other words, I would like the ability to do the equivalent of a display modify to, to see, hey, before I issue this import command, what resources are in use that could prevent this import command from succeeding, all right? Uh, so they're saying, you know, what you're really saying is you have to fail to determine 
you know, what was causing the failure? Well, I'd like to first find out before I fail, right? Uh, and, and, and this is really bad, especially for, for automated solutions. So, you know, th this is something that we're looking at. Um, and, and then there are some clients that have told us that import takes longer than traditional online change. Uh, we've got a couple of cases open for that, and we, we're trying to get to the bottom of that. Uh, you know, a, a client will open a case and say, you know, I did an import of this DVD, but it took longer than it would have taken when I did the traditional online change. Um, and it'll take a slightly longer, but not a whole big longer, because we, we also have to update the catalog now when we do the import, right? Uh, another thing that we're hearing is that import is more restrictive than online chain. So these are some things that 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 we are still trying to work through. Uh, there are some cases open uh, that, that we're still trying to work through. Okay, so that my, that's my introduction to IMS managed ACBs, the why and what of IMS managed ACBs. Comments, questions, thoughts. This is uh, one of the first webinars that I gave on the catalog. So those of you uh, that are still on this call and, and attended my webinar have heard this information before. So this will be a repeat. Those that haven't, well, now's your chance uh, to get plugged into IMS. Uh, so what I covered was, you know, the why and what of IMS managed ACBs. This is the catalog, right? Just basics about the IMS catalog. So let's get started. First thing I find whenever I talk to people that are just starting out, uh, you know, there's always a confusion confusion between the catalog, the directory, and the repository. And, and sometimes they think the repository is a catalog. And I go, no, 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 it's not. Those are three very separate things. So the catalog is not the IMS repository, right? The catalog is implemented as a HALDB database and it has your DVD, PSB, metadata uh, information. You can also include COBOL copybook information into the catalog. Now, now here's, here's one more thing that I, that I wanna stop and make sure that everybody understands this. Do you have to include COBOL copybook or PL1 includes into your catalog? Do you have to do that? The answer is no. The only time you need to do that is if you're going to write Java programs that are accessing IMS databases. If you're not going to write Java programs that are accessing IMS databases, then your catalog would only have your DVD, PSP metadata information, and you don't need to have the COBOL copybook information in there. The repository is not an IMS database. The repository is a vSAM data set, right? And the repository contains resource and descriptor definitions for your databases, for your programs, your transactions, your fast path routing codes, right? This is the type of information that usually goes into the IMS gem, right? And, and, and so if you want to, you can store this information into the repository. So, but what's in the catalog is very different from what's in the repository. These are two different entities. Please don't confuse the two. The catalog is different from the IMS directory as we just covered, right? The catalog has your DVD, PSV, and, and possibly your COBOL copybook metadata. It's primarily used by Java programs and it's used when, we, when you submit IMS DDL. The directory has the same information, but it's in a different format. The IMS directory has ACB blocks, right? So, so that's the one thing I, I want to make sure everybody understands this, which is, yes, the catalog and the directory are two different things, but yes, they have the same information, but it's in a different format. The directory houses ACB blocks. The catalog has that same information, but it's decoded and it's stored in that hierarchical fashion, right? So, so that's the first thing that I always... When I talk about the catalog, I go, hold on, let's get rid of the confusion, right? There's a difference between the catalog, the directory, and also the repository. Three very distinct and different things, right? 
Now, the catalog, as I mentioned, was introduced in version 12, uh, not at not when version 12 GA, but actually a, a few months after. Uh, it was optional back then, and even today, ladies and gentlemen, the catalog is optional up until we get to that new release that comes out next year, right? And, and then that release requires you to implement IMS managed ACBs. And as part of that implementation, you also have to implement the catalog. The catalog is a database. It's a HALDB database. Now, here's the question that people always ask me when I talk about the catalog. They go, why did you make it HALDB? Right? We don't use HALDB, right? Uh, why did you make it HALDB? And so when we were designing the catalog, we knew one thing. We knew that this was a database that will grow over time. And so it had to be partitioned. And so in IMS, when you partition databases, you really only have two choices. You can make it HALDB or you can make it DDBs. Those are the only two choices. We couldn't make it DDB because DDBs are not available in DLI batch. DDBs are only available to the online IMS system. And that ruled out DDBs. And so we went with HALDB, right? Um, also, by the way, this is a HALDB that uses OSAM. Uh, that's another question that I get asked by people. They go, well, you know, we don't use, in our shop, the standard is vSAM. Why did you not make it vSAM, right? This will be the only database that'll use OSAM. And, 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 and I say this honestly, and, and I'm not kidding, VSAM stands for what? And that's the joke in the industry. VSAM stands for a very slow access method, right? OSAM was an access method designed only for IMS. And again, it goes back to the history. It was designed because we wanted IMS to perform well. So it's with speed in mind, they developed OSAM. And because once you move to DDL, you know, catalog becomes the hub for your database administration. We wanted to make sure that there was going to be no performance issues. And so when we when we designed the catalog, we made it HALDB and we made it OSAM, right? And, and, and basically what's in the catalog is your DVD information, your PSP information. And if you want to optionally, you can have COBOL copybook or PL1 includes, right? Now, here's the thing. Catalog was introduced in version 12. For what? So that Java programs could access IMS data. But Java programs accessing IMS data was available since version seven of IMS, right? And, and so where was this metadata before the catalog came into play? Well, this metadata was spread out, right? Some of the information was in the DVD live. Some of the information was in the PSV live. You had your COBOL copybook information in your in your COBOL copybooks, right? Uh, and even in DVD lives, you know, you only defined even in your DVDs, you only defined key and search fields. You do not define every field of of every segment in your DVD, right? And and we used to have a a, a separate utility back then. Uh, this is prior to version twelve, and the utility went through different name changes. But at one point it was called, uh, uh, I think it was called the DLI model utility. And, you know, and it would generate this static metadata class that, that, that Java programs would use. So, so that's where all this metadata was. It was sort of spread out and we decided to put it into the catalog, right? And once you put it in the catalog, again, who uses this? This is our universal JDBC drivers or our, our universal DLI drivers. Uh, these are drivers that are used by Java programs when they access IMS databases. And of course, going forward, the catalog will also be used for DDL, right? Here's the other thing that I, that I wanna point out to people is that once you have the catalog implemented, right? And because IMS provides JDBC drivers, that can you know get the metadata information from the catalog. There are various products out there that allow you to do JDBC access to IMS that allow you to do JDBC access to databases. 
you can use those products with IMS. Now I've listed some products and most of these are IBM products, but non-IBM products could also be used. But, but let me give you an example. Um, in, in 2015, I was working on a project where I was uh, extracting IMS data and we were loading it into IDAA so that you could do analytics against IMS data in IDAA. So I was, I was working on this project and my first job was, okay, how can I extract IMS data? And so IBM had a product called Infosphere Data Stage. And Data Stage is an ETL tool, extract, transform, load tool. And, and with Data Stage, you know, uh, it provided JDBC access. So, so I, I, I spoke to the, the Data Stage people and I said, you know, we, it says in your documentation that you provide JDBC access to databases. Have you used it against IMS? And they said, no, we haven't, but you know what? If you have the JDBC driver, you put it in this folder. And if you have the catalog with the metadata, it should work. Give it a shot, let us know, all <laughs> right? Um, and so that's, I did what they told me. I, I took our JDBC drivers, I, I put them in a folder. We had the catalog all set up and I started to use data stage. And lo, lo and behold, you know, within seconds, it was extracting IMS data and I could take that extract data and then load that into IDA and, and do analytics with that. So, so, that, so that's another benefit with the, with the catalog is if you've got products that, that, you know, that support JDBC access to databases, well, you can use those products against IMS databases. Now, here's the other question that people ask me is, how can I see what's in the catalog, right? Well, again, the catalog is a database uh, and, and how can you see what's in IMS databases? Well, you can use JDBC calls from Java programs, right? Uh, SQL calls from things like uh, E4D, tools that support SQL access. Um, you can use DLI calls. So for example, uh, that, that uh, utility program uh, DFS DDLT0, that utility program, you can you know, code up DLI calls and you can issue calls against the catalog. And then we provide tooling. So IMS Explorer for Development is an Eclipse-based tool that we provide uh, that allows you to, to access uh, IMS databases by issuing SQL calls, right? Uh, so these are the different ways that you can look at what's in the IMS catalog. Are there cases where the catalog is required? Uh, yes. Uh, accessing IMS data from Java programs, you got to implement the catalog. Uh, if you're using database versioning, you got to implement the catalog. IMS managed ACBs requires that you implement the catalog and DDL requires IMS managed ACBs, which requires a catalog, right? These are all the instances in which you've got to implement the catalog, right? Now the catalog database, it's a PHIDAM OSAM, HAL DB database, uh, and as you as you heard in the earlier presentation, uh, it's defined with four data set groups. It has one secondary index on it, and that secondary index can be used to determine, you know, which PSBs reference is specific database um, without processing the entire catalog. That's what the purpose of that secondary index is, right? Um, because it's a HALDB database, uh, you can define partitions and that's up to you to decide how many partitions you want to make for this uh, HALDB database. Uh, we recommend a minimum of two, have one partitions for DBDs, one partitions for PSBs. We have some clients that have one partition for DBD and then several partitions for PSBs because they've got a lot of PSBs. Uh, the partitions are determined via high key specification, not via the partition selection exit, right? That is one difference between this HALDB and, and other HALDBs. Um, here's the other thing. I think this was brought up uh, via a question in the earlier presentation. They, somebody says, you know, do I have to register uh, the catalog with DBRC? And the answer is no. 
the catalog can be an unregistered catalog, meaning you do not have to register, register it with DBRC. Uh, this is the only HALDB, by the way, that has that option. This is the only HALDB that isn't required to be defined to DBRC in the recon. Um, and by the way, the, the IMS uh, system, uh, the, the catalog populate utility can allocate and create the catalog database data sets for you uh, based on SMS parameters that you code in the catalog section of DFS DF Rocklight member. Okay. Um, now the catalog is a is a database, right? Yeah, it's a HALDB database. And in IMS, every database has to have a DBD. And to access that database, we have to have PSBs, right? So what are the catalog DBDs and PSBs? Uh, we provide we give you the source code and the object code for the catalog DVDs and PSBs. The DVD for the catalog, it's a P Hydan DVD, and it's the DVD name is DFS CD triple zero. That's the name of the DVD. The secondary index, remember I said there's one secondary index. The, the secondary index DVD name is DFS CX triple zero, right? In terms of PSBs, we provide PSBs to load, read, and update the catalog. Uh, DFS CPL00 is a PSB that's used to initially load the catalog. This PSB is used by the catalog populate utility. Uh, DFS CP001 is used for update access to the catalog. Now, by the way, who's going to update the catalog? Uh, I want to make sure you understand this point. Who can update the catalog? The answer is no application program should ever update the catalog. The catalog is can be updated by the uh, by the ACB Gen and Catalog Populate Utility DFS three UACB. Uh, the Catalog Populate Utility can update the catalog. The Catalog Purge Utility can update the catalog. The import command updates the catalog, and that's it. So, so please make sure that no applications use DFS CP001 to update the catalog. There's another PSB called DFS CP000 that's used for read access to the catalog from COBOL or high level assembler programs. And then DFS CP002 to read from PL1 programs and DFS CP003 to read from Pascal programs, right? So these are the PSBs for, for the catalog. Here's the other thing that I want to point out. Uh, when the catalog is enabled in your system, IMS will automatically attach three catalog PCBs to every user PSB at scheduled time. Uh, and we do that so that if we have to access the catalog, we can do that. So for every user PSB at scheduled time, we attach three catalog PCBs. Now, what we found is that for some clients, not everybody, for some clients, those that have written assembler application programs, uh, and then depending upon how they coded those assembler as application programs, because we are now returning three additional catalog PCBs, that would cause problems for those programs. In some cases, they get overlays. So if you want to disable the dynamic attaching of catalog PCBs, there's a parameter that we just provided. That parameter is cat PSB attach equals no. You can code that in the catalog section of the DFS DF proc live member. And then we will not dynamically attach those catalog PCBs. This option was provided by APAR PH14717. This APAR just became available in December of, of last year. So, so just wanted to let you know about this. What is the catalog hierarchy? I think we, we looked at this in the previous presentation. Here it is. Uh, you'll see there's a header segment. And the header segment basically defines what's underneath that root segment. Is it a DBD or is it a PSB? If it's a DBD, you'll find a DBD segment underneath it. And then underneath the DVD segment, you'll find all those other segments underneath it, right? So 
All of those segment names that you see there, uh, those are equivalent to the macros that you code in DVDs or macros that you code on the PSV. And the segments are spread out across four data set groups, right? I talked about the header segment, that's the root segment. And it basically has on there, uh, you know, uh, first eight bytes of that header segment, the, the key field, the first eight bytes of the key field tell you what you, whether you have a DVD or PSB underneath that root segment. So, you, so it'll be PSB followed by five blanks or it'll be DVD followed by five blanks. And then the next eight bytes of the key field is the PSB name or the DVD name, All right? So that's the root segment and it's key. Um, the catalog also has a DVD vendor or a PSB vendor segment, and that is used to store, you know, macros uh, that uh, that might be vendor related. Uh, that's stored in the catalog in our DVD vendor or PSB vent, right? Now, what are the catalog database data set names? Every catalog uh, catalog is a is a HALDB database. So there's a HALDB data set prefix that you define and the data set names are going to be HALDB data set prefix dot. And then there are four data set groups, A, B, C, D, followed by the partition number. The dot X is for the high dam index and the dot L is for the ILDS data set, right? How does the metadata get into the IMS catalog? Well, this is typically how you've done your PSB gens your DBD gens and your ACB gens. And now if you want to populate the catalog, what you would do is you take the ACB library, use that as input to the catalog populate utility. DFS3 PU00 is the module name for the catalog populate utility. It'll take that PSB DBD information from the ACB library, uh, decode that, and then put that into the catalog. If you now also want to add COBOL copybook information, you can use IMS Explorer, or you can use tools. Vendors provide tools that can take the information from your COBOL copybook or your PL1 includes, and they'll include that information into your DVDs and uh, PSBs. And then you can do a PSB gen, DVD gen, and then do another ACB gen using DFS3 UACB. And that'll put that same information into the ACB library and it'll put that in the catalog. So now the ACB library and the catalog are kept in sync, okay? I already talked about DFS3 UACB. It goes through two steps. The first step is it does the ACB gen. Um, and, and then the second step is it, it gives that ACB block to the catalog populate utility. It decodes that and, and, and puts that uh, into the catalog. Um, the ACB gen, the catalog populate utility, the purge utility, the DDL, and the import command. These are the only updaters of the catalog. No IMS application program should ever update the IMS catalog, okay? Once the catalog is implemented, the catalog and ACB live must be kept in sync. And the way to do that is you can use DFS3 UACB to do ACB gens, or you can break it up as we talked about in the previous presentation. You can use the old ACB gen utility, uh, which uses the ACB catwork data set. And then you can use that ACB catwork data set as input uh, for the catalog populate utility. Right? Uh, so, Deepak, we've got a couple of questions that have come in. Go ahead. Uh, so why can ZDDL utility not update the catalog? The ZDDL utility does update the catalog, yes. Yeah, yeah, ZDDL does, you're right. Yeah, I should add that on here. Yeah, my bad, Heike, very good catch. Very good catch, so I need to add ZDDL utility to that, yeah. Okay. Question, Deepak. For me, uh, the ZDDL can only read, not update. And that's my problem. So I ask the question. 
you can read it if it uh, if something is in the catalog, but I don't no, know how. No, no, the ZDD. So the ZDDL utility takes as input DDL, and it processes that DDL, mm -hmm. and then updates the catalog, and it creates an ACB block and puts that ACB block in the directory data set. Ah, okay, so you mean that kind of update, okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Directory or staging? Yes. In the staging yes. directory, yes. In the staging directory, yes, yes. So that was, so we should do another session on ZDDL utility. Uh, oh, wonderful, great. Mm -hmm. yeah. Then there's a oh, question well. about removing the DBD PSB transactions. Uh, how do we remove DBD PSB transactions that are not used anymore? Yeah. You, you, can you elaborate on that, Eric? I'm trying to. Um, yes. Hello. You hear yes. me? Yes, I can. Uh, because I'm involved in some uh, uh, projects where we are uh, removing uh, obsolete uh, DBDs, PSBs, yes. and transactions. Yes. So, how do you remove them from the gen? I, uh... Yes, 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 yes. So, so, uh, so, so Eric is saying I found a DBD or a PSB, and we are no longer using it, and I like to get rid of that. Right. Um, and 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 uh, the only way to remove that from from the catalog is you're going to have to use the ZDDL utility to do, do a drop. I think that should be included in your <laughs> additional presentation. Yeah, of the DDL yeah, utility. you're right. Thank you're you. right. My bad. Yes, thank you. I I should include that. Yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for keeping me honest. And another question, Deepak. Um, for me, it's not clear. Um, what is the benefit of all that versions kept in the catalog? So normally you only use oh, yes. the Thank one. You. So I didn't get the sense of it. So can yes, you explain yes, yes. to me? God bless you. God bless you for asking that. Nobody asked a question, Heike. That, that was really good. So Heike is asking this question. Um, and I think I mentioned this earlier. Let's say I've got a database called DBD XYZ, right? And I do an ACB gen for DBD XYZ. So that'll create an instance in the catalog. I do another ACB gen for DBD XYZ that creates a second instance. I do a third ACB gen that creates a third instance. If I do 10 ACB gens for DBD XYZ, I'll have 10 entries or 10 instances in the catalog. And, and Heike is saying, you know, why? Why do you do this? What's the benefit of this? Quite frankly, and I'll be honest, I think the initial designers, I think they're, 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 they were thinking along the lines of, well, if you need to do a fallback, then the older instance will still be there. But we never really implemented that fallback capability. And, and so then they just introduced this utility called the catalog purge utility that you have to go in and, and, and run this utility to manually delete the older instances. Um, we have talked about automatically going in and, and deleting the older instances so that you don't have to run the purge utility. Uh, and, and that is you know, on our roadmap at some point, but we haven't quite gotten to it, right? So that's my honest answer. I agree with you. There really isn't much value there, yeah. Okay, Eric has to go. Thanks, Eric. Bye. Any other questions? Okay. All right, let me continue. Oh, then we have the summary page. So we talked about the catalog database, the hierarchy, the DVDs and PSBs, and then keeping the catalog and ACB lives in sync. Okay. Any other questions or comments? I have one last question. So is there any reason though to keep the catalog and the ACBs in sync if you haven't 
activated IMS managed ACBs yet, provided you're not using the metadata for ODB calls? Yeah, you know, once you, because, okay, yeah, so so the, the, the question is, you know, if I've implemented the catalog, but I'm really not using it, do I want to keep the catalog and ACB gen in sync? I mean, catalog and ACB libraries in sync. Um, when you go to implement IMS managed ACBs, then then yes, you you want your your catalog and your directory to be in sync. So if you're if you're not using the catalog um, and you don't want to keep it in sync, fine. But then when you implement IMS catalog you better just create a fresh catalog then so that it's in sync. Does that make sense? Yeah, and the reason I'm asking this question is that we have DC only IMSs in the same environment with DBDC systems and we're trying yeah. to update our, our change control system with the new ACB gen, but then we get into trouble where we don't have a solution yet for the DC system. So. We're trying to make everything work the same. And at some point I'm wondering, is it easier just to make our DC systems DBDC so that I can make it all the same everywhere? No, you don't, you don't want to do that for your no? DC systems because then you'll get charged for that DB license, no? Um, that, that's what I think. Um, can you do me a favor? Who's speaking? Gian Koopman from Ford. Yeah. Ah, uh, yes. Hi. Hi, Jan. Um, can, uh, I should get with you and see what your what your architecture is for DBDC and DC. Um, yeah, so I'll reach out to you, Jen. And, okay. And, and I'll set up a call um, because we, I was just in a meeting yesterday about having that IMS managed ACB solution for for uh, TM or DC only environments. And, and I want to understand your, your setup of DC and your DVDC systems. Are they separate? Are they sharing ACB libraries? Um, I, I want to just understand that so that as we design our solution, we want to make sure that we, we are taking care of you also. Does that make sense? Yep. Makes sense. Yeah, okay, yeah, thank so you. I'll, I'll reach out to you about that. Um, I think that's going to be important for us to know. They'll just help us to plan going forward. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and, and us too. Yeah, yeah. Good. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Okay. Um, Amanda, I think I'm done for today. Um, yeah. Well, thank you so much for for joining us and doing this. I think we have established that we need at least three more sessions to continue this conversation. Yeah. Yeah. Um, again, like I recognize it's a really important topic and I wanna thank everyone for hopping on today. Um, I know for some people it's a holiday even, so I appreciate you all um, being here and Deepak for delivering great session for us. Um, if there are uh, any additional questions, um, email them to me. I'll get them to Deepak or reach out to him directly. And um, with that, our next session will be in August and we'll be talking about managed ACBs um, and encryption. So um, a great topic to spin off from this. Um, hey, I, I gotta say uh -huh. before, before I get off is, uh, you know, I was very, very busy. I have, I have been very busy, but Amanda was very patient with me and kept pursuing me. So come on, we've got to have you do this session. So the, the folks at Planet Mainframe are really committed uh, to, to, to making sure that you guys get quality sessions. Um, and so I, I just wanted to say that. And uh, so please take advantage of them and join these sessions and, and um, make them successful. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I do see one question Brad had asked that we want to make sure gets answered. One last question about will catalog purge allow you to delete the obsolete objects? Yeah, that's the whole point of the catalog purge utility. Um, but but the, that purge utility can be tricky 
I have a webinar that I did and the recording of that is available on IMA Central. So please do make sure you listen to that. Um, and if there's any questions, let us know. And if we need to redo that session, we can do that too, yeah. Okay. I think yes, very answered, helpful. <laughs> yeah, I think we answered a lot of questions along the way. A um, Couple of people have been asking about the recording. So we will uh, publish the recording and a transcript and the deck on the virtual user groups webpage. And um, please go to virtualusergroups.com and subscribe to the newsletter. I imagine you probably already get it, but then you'll be able to get um, the email next month that will remind you that you are looking for the transcript and the video and everything. So that'll go out. Um, That's great information. And I would just ask a question if you expect that utilities like the load, reload will involve version numbers so that when the database gets started after being structurally changed, it'll dynamically load the right version for the ACBs. Okay. Tom, can you send me an email about that? That, that was Tom, right? Ben. Oh, Ben. Sorry, Ben. Okay, so so Ben, would you send me an email about that, please? You, you have sure. my email ID, dpackheadus.ibm.com. And Steve Watson says, please give the website again. Which which website is Steve asking for? I believe he's asking for virtual user groups. That's the one I dropped. Oh, okay, all right. Heike is asking about the new utilities, a chart. Heike, which uh, new utilities do you mean? Do you, do you mean DFS3 UACB? Yes, uh, all new utilities. Uh, I can find them in documentation, but I miss a slide where I have on the left-hand side all the utilities and on the right-hand side um, some remarks, what they are doing and uh, how I can organize to let them run well. That's my question. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. Can you help Email or is me. there a red book uh, for all that? Well, well I, I think what I was trying to say, Heike, was that we, we've just made sure that all the utilities are able to run in an IMS managed ACB environment. It, they're not new utilities. It's the existing utilities and, and they can run in an IMS managed ACB environment. And all you have to do is, is specify the DFSDF uh, proc -like member suffix. Okay. Okay. But Heike, I think you have my email. Uh, if you have further questions, feel free to email me, please. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, Deepak, um, I've got a couple of announcements and y'all feel free to drop in with any more questions. Um, but Deepak, could you put in your email address in chat? Is that possible? Yeah, doing it right now. Thank you. Uh, so I just wanted to, um, direct y'all to a couple of articles and news. Uh, was that not that virtualusergroups.com didn't work, I guess? Yeah, Douglas wanted the virtual user, yeah. Let's see. Okay. Uh, so just a couple of um, announcements and things to bring your attention. Oh, okay. Um, our partner is BMC, so obviously they have a tool for IMS. You can uh, check out the ME data tool. Um, these are QR codes if you want to scan them. All of this is also able to be Google searched. Um, and then it has been Observability and Resiliency Month at Planet Mainframe, so we published a good bit of content on those topics. Um, we are always looking for more contributors to publish with us. So if you've got something that is of interest, an article, uh, some commentary, uh, let me know, reach out. We'd love to talk to you about publishing. And um, I mentioned in chat, but we have a job board, jobs.planetmainframe.com. Um, I did check it this morning. This is an opportunity in San Jose, but there are quite a few, um, there were quite a few newer IMS openings there. Um, I'm going to just show you the next slide, but I'm not going to talk about how to connect with us on social media. I do see a question that came in for you, Deepak. Um, 
Yeah, um, some workflow for from Heike. MACB support. We have an Ansible. Uh, uh, yeah, well, we have an Ansible uh, the, the module that will allow you to uh, um, use ZDDL for ZSMF workflow. I believe we do, Heike. Uh, I'll check on that. I think we do have a ZSMF workflow. Great. Well, Deepak, it looks like we are out of questions, but I want to thank you for such a great session. I loved the um, amount of conversation that happened today in our chat. Um, it's always great to see when people have questions and then um, people were answering questions too. So that was fantastic. I love that. Um, I am actually going to see if I can pull the chat just because I want to make sure if there are any questions in it. Uh, from today that we can get, we'll post any of the answers that I saw in it. So pulling that right now. And um, before you go, as you are pressing exit, you'll get a survey. Again, it's just two questions. So take a look uh, on your way out. Well, great. Well, thank you all so much. We'll see you uh, in two months for our next one. And Deepak, again, thank you. Thanks, Amanda. Bye, everybody. Take care. Bye.